Welcome to Devi DGENs. We are on episode seven of this show, and thank you for tuning in again. As always, I'm here with Todd Vincent at Hobart Whipple. I am Noah Green. Todd, how are you doing today? I'm good, good. How are you? Doing well, man. How's uh, Canadian Thanksgiving treating you? Uh, it, it's not bad. It's been a pretty quiet weekend, which is good. So, so it's good there. Weather is not great. We're pretty, uh, pretty cold and wet right now. So, yeah, it's nasty out here too. We're we're living with it though. Um, today we have, uh, we're really excited to have a guest with us. So we've got Kevin Coleman at the Boys Twenty Two on Twitter and Kevin is with Football Guys, the Debbie Royale and one of the original sort of uh, Debbie godfathers, if you will. Uh, Kevin, you probably hear that phrase all the time. It's probably overused, so <laughs> apologize for using it again. But um, Kevin, welcome to the show. And I, I'm excited to have you here because when I was first getting into content, you were, I think you were the first person that I talked to uh, and we just had like an hour long conversation and I got to pick your brain about content creation and it was incredibly helpful. And I think a lot of the things that we talked about led to my kind of journey of finding this uh, this awesome group with Dynasty DGENs and the best co-host I could imagine and Todd. So I'm thankful to you for all your help and welcome to the show, man. How are you doing out in California today? Oh, we're good. Weather's great out here, boys. So, you know, that's the California way. Uh, but no, we're we're doing good. I'm excited to be on, talk a little Debbie. I don't talk as much Debbie as I used to. Uh, so it's always good when I can come in here and chop it up a little bit. Yeah, for sure. We're really excited to have you. And um, I know you're a, you're a Fresno State guy. Sorry about the loss this weekend. That was uh, that was a rough setback. But uh, you got you get you have tickets, right? You have season tickets? Yeah, I didn't get them this year. Uh, we didn't. I just, but I usually go. Yeah, I have a season tickets usually every year, but this year is not working out with the family. So we had our new baby. So once you add that third kid, it gets a little harder to be like, hey, babe, I'm going to go to a game. Um, but we are, uh, yeah, it's been good. I'm a Michigan fan, though. I just am a Fresno State transplant because I live close. So I have two teams. So Michigan's doing all right. We'll just, we'll just hang with Michigan for now. There you go. Yeah, Michigan is doing all right. I'm wearing my, I'm I'm wearing my SC gear really just tentatively right now because man, we are uh, we are really good at, at at winning very badly right now. So uh, really uh, s stressful stressful games for for what I think are somewhat avoidable reasons. But topic for another show. Um, before we dive into it, though, uh, Kevin, yeah, you were saying you didn't, you don't get to talk Debbie as much anymore. But um, how did you originally get into Debbie when you were first starting out? Oh man, you know, uh, oh man, I have to think about that. So when I when I first kind of the pandemic hit in that 2020 year, you know, um, that's when I started getting into content. But first started getting into Debbie. Uh, I actually drafted Zeke as a sophomore. That's how that's when it was um, in my first Debbie league. Um, I was a huge just college football fan. And then my buddy played in a Debbie league and he's like, Hey, we have a league that you could draft college guys. I was like, Oh shit. Yeah. Sign me up. So like, that's when it started. And then it just kind of um, morphed into more Debbie leagues. And then as you find out, you know, if you play in Debbie, you're pretty much a degenerate. Like I think Todd has 75,000 leagues. I'm not sure how many leagues Todd has, but he's got enough out there for everybody. Um, and it just morphed into it. So then I started playing it, playing different leagues, you know, 
Uh, college fantasy is something that I just started a few years ago. So I'm like, not as, I'm not as heavy into that. Like the CFF stuff is crazy. Like, I don't even know how people do it. I do best ball CFF a lot. That's easier for me. Uh, but you know, from Debbie's standpoint, I think it fits with dynasty. So it kind of makes my job easier. We, you know, we've transformed it into like a rookie guide and done some stuff for football guys. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, just basically started cause I like college football, got in the league and then it just transformed from there. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I I personally feel the same way about it in, in just getting into Debbie. And I'm what I'm loving about it right now in in mid season is just already now is I think when a lot of the sort of comparisons and projections from college to NFL start to get really real. Like the off season's just a lot of talk and buzz and spring games and all of that kind of um all of that kind of work and uh todd doing immaculate rankings as always uh before everybody else does them but uh basically now we're actually getting into the real game of it which is which is really really cool um so i'm really excited about that um and todd i know you you got you got into this somewhat similarly i believe right like you started there was a you found a league with some buddies and just started getting into it and then moved into scouting basically yeah i found it like hopped over like traditional Debbie. I kind of just like same thing, like content wise, I kind of stumbled into like the C2C guys and that type of stuff and Kevin, their, their stuff. And then I don't know, like the whole traditional Debbie, like five round thing didn't really speak to me, but the, the whole C2C thing did. And now I've kind of, we've kind of like reeled it in because now we got Kevin, the TDR guys, we did the discord uh, pipeline league, which is uh, like G5 or sorry, P5 only and best ball on the college side uh and then so we did one with the discord and i have one with my buddies from my home league about i'd say half of them from my home, home league and then some other guys off twitter and stuff like that i'm actually loving those leagues i love the power five best ball leagues uh just because i'm more like i just want like an extended debbie i'm trying to find something that will bridge the gap between the standard five round debbie and the fully immersed c2c because even the c2c thing i know it's not a popular opinion but i just i don't care about the g five guys i don't care about guys that are never going to play in the nfl and i don't love the fact that like the winning the winning side on that side is often just like 90 percent of guys that you're never going to hear their names again once they graduate from college i just i mean i get it but at the same point i kind of i kind of more like a prospect eval type type of interest in it so i kind of kind of wanted to even that playing field a little bit can i go on a rant noah real quick on that too oh please so my big thing and the reason why I've stepped away from the CTC format as well on that side is like I got into these leagues the last few years and I see some guys literally just selling like their first eight or nine picks on the NCAA side and just load up on the NFL side. And then they just go get dudes from Akron and Ohio and all these other guys. And I, I really feel like that's not the formats what it was built on. And, and it was built by Shaq. Uh, this guy named Shaq, Brian, he's on Twitter every once in a while, but that wasn't what he, I mean, it was really built for, Hey, building a dynasty on both sides and build for the NFL side and have a true like program through. Um, and I think it cheapens the format a little bit when guys do that. And I think that's one reason why I stepped away from it a little bit too, is because, you know, I, I hated that stuff. And to be honest, it's not very open to the normal fantasy player because I don't care who the Ohio running back is because he's not Debbie relevant. I guarantee it. And so like, and that, you know, for me, like that is one of the reasons why I like the, the power five. And honestly, like, I think next year, I think there's an open market for just big 12 or big 10, excuse me, big 10 sec, like, straight up best ball leagues or something like that. Like just the big two conferences, maybe ACC in there um, because that's going to market better for just the normal fantasy people there. Um, and that's why I've actually, I've really shifted back to it, but yeah, I hate when guys just, you know, they use that, the, the G five kind of the, the dudes in there and they plug these guys in 30, 40 fantasy points a week. I mean, I guess it's part of it. Um, but I think it lessens and cheapens the format. Like I like, you know, I think it really should matter for who you're drafting going to the NFL side. So I'm, I'm, a, I have full agreement with Todd, which never happens. Like, I don't, I don't trust Todd. Like I'm not a big Todd guy here, like in terms of agreeing with him. Uh, but that is one thing I really do think it cheapens the format because I don't think that's what the format was created for and i think that's the wrong way to play it uh yeah i think that's totally right and and 
I was I was venting to Todd earlier today because I, I actually tweeted last night that I have come to the realization that I have no ability to set a lineup on a, on my C two C side on my college <laughs> yeah. side for like yeah. a variety of reasons, and I lose every week. And I'm looking, at, I'm like, my team has much better players here, but I'm losing to guys that are putting up God knows how many points, and there's very late injury notification. So like, I think the best ball piece is really valuable for the normal. Like, mm-hmm. I'm very involved in football. And I miss college injuries pretty frequently. And I'm very up on news. Like if something happens, I usually know it within like two minutes. But listen, when Kansas, when Jalen Daniels is out for Kansas and they announce at game time and we have lives, like you can't always change that. Um, And Todd and I have talked about how if you are going to do a league like that, having the ability to set a replacement player is really important also. But I think moving to the best ball format for the college side is really great and would encourage a lot more participation. And I think focusing it on the big conferences, especially with the realignment is really interesting. And I think combined with, I think combined this coming year with the relaunch of the EA NCAA franchise, which I think is going to get a lot, even more interest in college football and get people really into the players, I think could see a launch in that side of the format if, if we make yeah. it a little more accessible. Um, sweet. So today, uh, today we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about some Devi hot takes, and by hot we mean interesting and aggressive and strong takes, and we are going to evaluate them and determine if they are fact, fiction, or fool's gold. Um, and before we start that, uh, I'm going to make Todd, Todd has a beautiful explanation for what fool's gold is. So I'm going to ask Todd to explain to our listeners what we mean by <laughs> fool's gold before we start labeling various interesting takes fool's gold. Yeah, I don't know if it's that interesting. Like, obviously, we know what fact <laughs> and fiction is. Fool's gold, fool's gold can, can really be anything, and we can take it a couple ways. And I'll probably cheat and use it to my advantage in another explanation but it's just i guess something that you could be like absolute absurdity but it doesn't even have to be that way i think it's it can be like a like a trap play too i think i think there's a couple of these questions that are like it might be kind of factual that it'll happen but fool's golden that if you buy into it you're selling yourself short yeah yeah i think that makes sense it's like it 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 might actually happen but actually even if it happens the way it stated that it happens that actual thing that actual player getting that draft capital for example or being the rb2 and debbie for next year or qb2 or whatever it is is actually a fool's gold play even if they end up that qb2 or um or end up in that spot Awesome. So uh, we we came up with a few of these, and we also asked folks on Twitter and in some discords to contribute. So everyone who contributed, we did take your takes and add them in here, and we will uh, we will go around and let y'all know what we think about each of them. So the first one uh, is that Drake May, who has been, I think it's safe to say Drake May has been the consensus to this point. QB2 of the 24 class. Uh, the the take is that Drake May is in fact the QB2 of the 24 class and therefore is the 103 in 24 dynasty rookie drafts. So the question is, is that fact fiction or fool's gold? Kevin, what do you think about Drake? Uh, so I think it's fact right now. I, I'm not, I'm not there with JJ. Um, I know that my co-host Christian Williams is there with JJ, but I'm, I'm not quite there with JJ. I think Drake has, has improved this season. I mean, and he didn't have Walker for the majority of the year. Um, now that he's back, we're going to see that, you know, he makes these subtle throws that you like to see from him. And, and I really think like his deep ball is better than yours. Like by far, yours problem is his deep ball. Drake may has the deep ball. I, I think that he can make, he has too many interceptions though. And I, and I, I think there is something to say with like these North Carolina areas. Like we were talking about it the other day with Hal. 
you know, the reason why Sam Howell struggles is because his reads, he doesn't read the field fast enough. And I think that's something that Drake may sometimes struggles with too. I, I do think that he struggles with his first and second read. Um, and that's something he's got to improve on because NFL teams aren't going to like that. So the, I think the question is, I mean, it's a fact now as a quarterback, I think he's the best arm talent of this group, but if they get into the, you know, the off season and they start going into the testing and JJ's there and JJ's an athlete and he maybe can read and process better. Teams might look at some of these guys and be like, well, I could take JJ and turn him into good Daniel Jones, as Todd likes to say. Um, and maybe with that <laughs> rushing upside from a fantasy perspective, right? Um, where Drake, it's like, hey, he struggles processing. He struggles this. So I think it's a fact for now. But I do think that the gap's not as, not as big as people think it is. Like, I do think that Drake is is there. And Michael Penix Jr. is out there, these other guys. Um, but just from a standpoint, a talent standpoint, I'll say fact. But if I'm not very, like, I mean, I guess it's, I'm not hugely confident in that take. But I do think right now Drake May is QB2. And if he's QB two right now, are you taking him? Are you are you right now? Would you project him as one hundred three in a dynasty rookie draft? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Todd, what do you got? Yeah, I'm, I've been kind of like known for pushing back on Drake May a little bit this off season. Um, I don't know. I think it's this is this is take is probably fact. And he's probably like he's he I even said it all, all along. I think he'll probably be QB2. And I think he's probably gonna be the 103 in Superflex. My issue was more in C2C and Debbie at the start of the season was the costs and the other players who are passing up on them because there's so much uncertainty with it. There's still uncertainty with it. Like Carolina's North Carolina's not a very good team. I thought I thought Texas was gonna make the playoff, but Oklahoma might have put a stop to that yesterday. So, but Michigan, Michigan should. So like all that stuff matters in the end, when it comes down to the evaluation, that stuff gets kind of baked in and those guys get to play on the national spotlight a little more. It kind of elevates their, their profiles. And I think like, I think JJ McCarthy will test really well, but I honestly don't know if JJ McCarthy's going to draft this year. I think he might be like, I think if he holds off till next year, he's probably the favorite for like the first number one overall. Cause I think he's, higher than Shadur, and I think he's probably better than, I don't know if he's better than Alar, but Alar's all arm and like he's a big dude, but I don't think that, I don't think it is like his mobility and stuff is not going to translate. I think that's something with Drake May too, that people were talking about with, with Sam Howell, that like all these rushing errors were going to translate to the NFL and just, it never was going to, if you watched them. I would, I really would like to see Drake may like at Alabama or something. I would have liked him step up in competition for this year to kind of spotlight himself, but I still think it's probably fact. Yeah, I think it's fact. Also, I think it's, I, I think it's, I think it risks being fool's gold. So I think in that, I think it is probably, I think if Drake may declares and the class is as it is right now and uh, Kevin actually, cause you're, more tapped into the Michigan pipeline. Like, is the JJ staying at Michigan? Is that a real, is that a real possibility? Uh, you know, I think it just entirely depends on how their season plays out. Like if they go back to the playoff, they beat Ohio state again. I think he's gone. Um, but like, and, and it really just comes down to what Harbaugh is going to do. Cause I don't think he's going to be there if Harbaugh is not there. So like, I, I think there's, there's a lot of question marks on that side, but from like a player standpoint, if he, if they win the big 10 again, I think he's going to be gone. But like Todd talked about, I mean, yeah, I think there are less question marks next year or, you know, I mean, there's more question marks next year with the class. So if he wants to come out, yeah, he could be there. I mean, Drew Aller, me and Todd will fight today. I think Aller is a QB one in that class, um, but I would take JJ over Shador in a heartbeat. So like, I, I think that there's differences in terms of, of those guys, but yeah, I think, I think there's a possibility he comes back, but I think it just would have to be, Hey, they lose to Penn state. They lose to Ohio state. Maybe they don't look as good. He doesn't look as good in those games. And then, Oh, okay. I can come back another year and develop and look at the Bo Nicks and look at these guys that have done that. Um, but I think it's just entirely dependent on those two games. And then are they back in that big 10 championship? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. And, and if they go on a run, the thing that's interesting about this take is based on the JJ piece is like, well, the Ewers loss was huge because, um, and I'm actually with you, Kevin. I don't think, I don't think Ewers has Drake May's arm talent. I also don't think he's got JJ's. Um, I've got him below both those guys. I, I just don't think he's quite there. But if JJ, if Michigan goes on a run 
And if they go to the playoff, and even if they win the playoff, which right now is certainly in contention, he could he could definitely jump May for the QB2 in this class easily, in which case I think he would go, and then Drake would potentially not be the QB2 because I don't think North Carolina is going to do that same thing. Um, I do think that Drake May is one of those players where – I, I want to say Justin Herbert. Like, I think if Drake, I think who Drake May gets into the hands of on the NFL side is going to matter a lot for him because I think mm-hmm. he's got a lot of raw tools. But I think that if he gets into a situation that is really messy and he doesn't have a really good QB handler, we've seen how that can go real bad. And so I will be watching that closely for him from the QB3 perspective just because um, I'm not. I'm not completely bought into the idea that he can just walk in and change a culture of an NFL team and be that guy in that way. So I'm, I'm hesitant to, I, I'm going to say it's fact with the potential of being Pools gold. Cause I think he could even achieve that goal and then still end up in a situation that ends up looking really messy and uh, being really complicated. But if he does get that QB two spot, if he's top five pick, he probably has to be the 103 in the 24 rookie drafts looking at this class right now. So I'm going to say fact with the, with a twinge of, of a possibility of pools gold. Um, all right. So next on our list is a very hot topic this weekend and pretty constantly in the Debbie C2C community, which is uh, Brock Bowers. And the take is that Brock Bowers is a top three dynasty tight end the second that he hits the league. And the question is whether that is fact, fiction, or fool's gold. Todd, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going fact. Simple. I hate tight ends. (laughs) Do you like Sam Laporta at least? Come on. I I do. Not as much as everyone else does. The problem is, like, (laughs) like I said, I said before that, like, I think, like, We've seen with a guy like Hawkinson, who's taken like four or five years for him to really garner this kind of like value that he came out of college with. And there's been other misses and stuff along the way, but I just don't know. Like there's, it's so rare to have a guy like Kelsey. They just, it's, he's like a unicorn and everyone, we're not going to like the top three or four. They're all touchdown dependent. They're weekly touchdown dependent. It doesn't, it takes like a perfect storm of a guy being like good enough player, first of all then usually a good enough athlete and then play either in a super high up-tempo, high-paced scheme or be the number one by default and just get a bunch of targets. So and then it's, it's only been like maybe three or four of them that have been like stayed in that, in that grouping over the last six to 10 years too. So yeah, fact, whatever. Fact. <laughs> Kevin, you love tight ends, right? I fucking hate tight ends as well. Like I, I think, um, you know, I'm gonna say fiction though, because like I don't think he's a top th- top three just right in. I think, I mean, Todd was kind of making my point for me. I'm not sure what side Todd is on. Like I, I think it takes time. I think you have Hawkinson. Like I, I think that you like like you mentioned. Um, and I, I'm just looking at my tight end rankings right now for Dynasty, and it's disgusting. Like I, I, I don't, you know, like when you look at them, you're just like, I mean, for some reason I don't have Travis Kelsey on here. So that's definitely a mistake. I got to fix later. Uh, but like, you know, you have Kelsey, you got Andrews, you know, when you're just looking at the guys that are there, uh, Laporta, Kincaid, maybe is Pitts going to ever be whatever. Like I see the argument for why he could be a top three because there's nothing there. And it's just like a disgusting position. Um, the problem is, is I, I would never value him there because yeah. like if I rostered him, sure, I'll value him there because I want to trade. Like I'll trade you and I'll, I'll get that. And I think it's just the question marks is like Michael Mayer is someone that I really like. I liked Michael Mayer for three years. And then now it's like, oh, wait, Sam Laporta got better draft capital. Now Laporta is a top three guy. So like I think Brock can come in, but I don't think a second he hits the league. I think it'll be a top five. I think he'll have that Kincaid bump. Um, and he'll be right around there. But top three, I don't think I'm there yet with him. And I think some with Pitts and these other things have kind of shocked you a little bit because it's such just a it's just a landmine of a position. So I'm going to say f- a fiction. I love it. Uh, I also hate tight ends, and I'm a I'm a I'm a learned tight end hater because when I 
first started playing Dynasty, I um, I drafted a lot of young tight ends that were sort of quote unquote hot in the nine to 13, 14 tight end range and just have a few rosters that were just burned. And thankfully, I was able to trade off uh, I, this past offseason. I learned from that and traded off a whole bunch of those guys. Like I traded off many shares of Chig for second rounders, two second rounders in a package to get Cooper Cup and a pack, right? Like I'm just, if I can get, if, if, a, t- if a tight end is hot, I'm going to move them. I think Bowers is interesting. So the, like the concern with Bowers is his position and his size. I'm interested to see how Bowers plays in the NFL because his, his metrics are, his metrics are really interesting and his game seems to be a little bit different than some of the other guys we've seen come out, even Pitts, honestly, um, was looking at this recently because Pitts got that big athleticism bump. This is a unicorn athlete coming in at the position with the high draft capital was getting drafted in the first round of dynasty startups. Um, and obviously has, has not panned out to that, to that return at all. And I don't think Bowers should be that, but I'm kind of like, I I think Bowers talent is so interesting that he can come in and profiles as a guy who could be a number one target for a team, which maybe not right away, but I think he profiles that way. Now I may come to absolutely hate this take a year from now, the same way you're talking about mayor. Like this may be a, a clip that I hate to look back on and maybe nerd clips it and, you know, puts out, puts out a, a blooper video and, and that's this take. But I think Bowers is so good that he's worth thinking about on that level because I just think he's a different kind of talent. So I would probably put him there. And still with that said, I'm not drafting him in the top three to five, probably of rookie drafts next year, um, because I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that investment on a tight end unless, unless the team he ends up on is, is, is such a plum situation, but even still, you see that with Kincaid now, like that's why everybody took Kincaid and he certainly has not started out the way that you, you, you would want a tight end to start out. So I think, um, I think he probably, I think he will be from a value perspective. So I'm going to say fact, and I think he is good enough to get there. So I guess I'm going to stay fact and just see if it sticks, but I'm, I'm very hesitant about it because I've been burned a lot on these tight ends, but I think Bowers might have a different skill set. So I'm going to stick with fact and move on to our favorite next take. This was, uh, this one came in from uh, from Vince with the caveat of uh, from one Coleman to another. So the take is that Keon Coleman, wide receiver from Florida State, will go top 15 in the 2024 NFL draft. Todd, talk about Keon Coleman. Oh, this is this is fool's goal for me. And this is one of the ones, this is one of the ones that I kind of hinted at. That I don't think top fifteen is so aggressive. I don't think he's going in the top fifteen. We do this every year with these guys, but even if he gets like anywhere near that top fifteen, top twenty, even anywhere in the first round, I think it's fool's gold because I think he's not a top five receiver in the class for me. I I don't think like he's in that six to nine range. I think you can put him in. But I think if he goes fifteen, I think he people are just going to overdraft him because of the draft position and wherever wherever he lands and I don't think I'm not taking him over like obviously Marvin Sanders Jr. but I'm not taking over Mecca. I'm not taking him over Worthy I'm not taking him over Neighbors I'm not taking him over Troy Franklin after that then you can start questioning it so not he, it's fool's goal for me because I think if he gets even if it's true and he gets it I think you're reaching on him based on the talent so yeah for me he's fool's goal what do you think Kevin? yeah yeah, I mean, I'll say fool's gold just because I want to use the word fool's gold. I think the reason why he's fool's gold, though, is he is not what NFL teams want at the wide receiver position right now. So, and what I mean by that is they want the Xavier Worthy. They kind of want the Malik Neighbors. Malik Neighbors is like the perfect kind of concept of like, hey, that's what they're kind of going to. Uh, even like, dare I say, Jacob Cowing, right? I'm going to still stay on the Jacob Cowing train forever because I was a Zay yes. Flowers guy. Like, they like those guys, right? So what I'm what I'm trying to project here is like, I like Keon. Like, I think that Keon is right there. Like, I have him 
you know, I have him in my top 12 in terms of my big board. Um, but I could definitely see guys, you know, like Jalen McMillan. I could see guys that not necessarily that people are thinking about that could have a better NFL fantasy production from that. Um, I don't think he goes top 15. I, that would be, that would be, that's very aggressive. Um, Cause I still think wide receivers in terms of this class are still going to be valued around the same as like this year. So 17 to 28 in that range. Like that's just kind of generally what we're speaking, especially cause I think the offensive line and defensive line in this class is a lot better. And I think that's where the position of value is going to be in this. And then after Marvin Harrison jr, it's going to be like, who's going to go up there. I, I think Malik neighbors are probably going to get drafted higher than Keon Coleman. If I had to just guess, like if I, if I was sitting here trying to think of projecting out that far away. Um, so yeah, I, I like Keon, but again, we don't see a lot of six four two fifteen guys like him, and I do know he has athleticism, but he's pretty, you know, with Keon, he, he, um, consistency is a problem. Like he's he's up and down consistency wise, and I think I think that's something to note about about him from a production standpoint. Is like, hey, why is he so inconsistent? I don't think he's a great separator, in my opinion. Like, and so if he's not that good of a separator as well, like you're looking at like a George Pickens type player. But I thought Pickens was a way better prospect than Keon was. Um, so that's where I'm. I struggle with Keon in terms of just his NFL upside. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Um, and I do think, I do think there's a chance he ends up getting drafted in the first round. Uh, and I do think that he fits in the top 12 of the 24 class right now, for sure. And I actually, I, I liked his talent a lot and I liked him. I liked him at Michigan state, interestingly. And when he moved to Florida state, he blew up the first game. But what's interesting about when he moved into the into the higher profile program, you kind of saw some of that inconsistency you were talking about and his metrics. So I pulled this for uh, for the entire uh, 24 sort of eligible recruiting classes. Uh, and to your point about separation, uh, he has the highest he has the highest percentage of his targets are contested. And it's not close. He's 42% of his targets are contested targets. And now he's very good at contested catches, similar to Pickens. He's very good at contested catches, but 42%, the next highest is in the 20s. So he's he's definitely does, I think, struggle to separate. And, you know, Todd and I were talking about this earlier. Pickens was a five-star recruit who came and popped a little bit as a freshman, struggled with some injuries in a in a complicated offense, and is developing and is Look, he hit today. Last week, he was a dud. He is a very – Pickens is kind of a fun best ball guy, but a very tough guy to have on a dynasty roster because you just kind of don't know when. And even today, he had nothing going before, you know, two minutes left in the third quarter and then all of a sudden went nuts and put up a bunch of points, and he's an inconsistent fantasy asset. So I think he'll go for I, – I think Keon could go first round, especially because there's a lack of size in in – last year's receiving core and maybe a team falls for his talent and gets into it. I could also, I, I, I think he goes at least second round. I don't think he'll fall past that unless he really duds out the rest of the year and really doesn't do anything. But I think as a dynasty asset, I am, I'm, I'm a little, I'm hesitant on him as a dynasty asset because I don't think he fits the NFL right now. All right. Nick Singleton is the Devi RB1. By that meaning, the top RB, if you're ranking all the running backs in college, all classes, Nick Singleton is the Devi RB1. I'll, I, I haven't kicked one off, so I'll start this one. I have had Nick Singleton as my Devi RB1 from the beginning, and I still slight, I, I still do, uh, but this year makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, he has, he has had one of the, and basically I don't know, I think I don't know what's going on with him. I'm wondering if he is dealing with some kind of nagging injury that isn't being talked about, or if there's some kind of issue going on because his efficiency has gone down, like his expected, his yards above expected, which is a really important metric for running backs has had the largest dip that. I've ever seen since I started looking at the metric. Um, he went from being 1.37, which is absurd, to being below, ne like almost negative one. It's like negative 0.9. So he's had an incredible dip in efficiency. I don't know if that's a system thing. I don't know if it's a health thing. 
we've talked about his running style being very based on his athleticism and talent. I think his talent still has him as, as the Debbie RB one, because I think his talent's unique, but I'm pretty, I'm very close to slipping Travion in ahead of him as, as the Debbie RB one right now. Uh, so I, I'm a very hesitant fact with, with some questions. I'm not ready to say fool's gold yet because the, the upside is really high. And with Debbie, we are drafting for upside. But um, I'll say a very tentative fact on that one. What do y'all think? Go ahead, Todd. I have him as I have him as my one A. I have him and Travion one A one and one B. So I kind of flip flop them. I have never got off the Travion train. I still like Travion going forward. I think it's it's fact, I guess. But I mean, it's it's a lot of the profiles built on. He's like a he's a specimen, right? He's a size adjusted B guy. So um, he you can't teach that. And he could like if he hits a ceiling, then he's a huge difference maker. But it's also a lot of it's to do with the running back landscape right now too. I know people like we talked about it. Kev's talked about it on the the Dynasty show and the Dead Royale and stuff. I still don't think like I don't mind if you prefer to build through wide receivers. I just don't, and I do a lot. Most of my teams actually do, um, but I don't think it's it's necessarily just the cut and dry. Don't draft Debbie RBs. I think it's more the landscape because you see the McCaffreys and the like Saquon's and Bijan, those guys are the only guys that hit at a high level and repeat and stay within that, like give you that top five upside repeatedly, even top 12 upside. Uh, but it's the fact it's, it's why like zero RB is a thing, right? Cause the fragility and it's opportunity baked into it that these guys rotate through so much that you can find a guy and plug them in and get points off them that way. So yeah, it's fact, but I don't, I don't love the front and backs are right now Debbie. So it is what it is. I think it's fool's gold a little bit. Now he's my two, I think. So like everybody out there, don't come and try to burn my house down. But like, I think I have Travion and Singleton. But the reason why I say fools is because like Todd talked about, I don't see anybody in like the B. John Robinson, uh, Saquon Barkley tier in college football. So if, if those guys aren't in there, I'm not touching these guys, right? Like last year, I built through a few of my teams. I have Luther Burden and Evan Stewart on one, on a few of my rosters. The reason why is because I went heavy wide receiver and I just said, screw it. That's where I'm building. And I took a little hit last year, but this year they're performing. So I think that with, with Singleton, I mean, I don't even know if he's going to be the best NFL running back on his own roster right now. Like, I do still think Katron Allen could project better as an NFL player. So, like, that's where you get concerned about with the running back position. Like, there's all kinds of guys. Look at Jonathan Brooks right now. Jonathan Brooks might be, and we're going to talk about him later, but we could just, he could have a better first rookie year than both Henderson and maybe like Braylon Allen, some of these guys that we've been talking about for years. Like, that's because the position is so volatile. So, it's like, that's why I say it's fool's goal. It's not that he's not good. He's my number two back, but I think it's just my, my preference to stay away from guys unless they are true now i thought travion was that guy i still kind of do think travion is that like, i feel like I, I, that might be a take lock um because i thought travion and Bijan was a real competition two years ago and i'll stand by it like i still thought it was a real competition value baked in so i still think travion could be that guy but again there's a lot of question marks there and you just look at the landscape I don't know if there's anyone like that and it, throughout the classes, 26 class is a joke right now. I don't know where to go with that class. I still like Cedric, but I don't like Cedric as much as I like some of these other guys when they were freshmen. Um, Darius Taylor, some of these other guys that have kind of popped off that came out of nowhere. Don't love those guys. Judkins and those guys. Like there's so many question marks. Like that's why it's fool's gold to me. Cause the position is fool's gold. Like the entire position is fool's gold to me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm entirely I'm in entire agreement about that. And we have a we have a take. I'm gonna I'm gonna double up this take with Travion being the RB one in the twenty four class. And it sounds like we're all aligned that at least as of right now, he is the the twenty four RB one. But I have started I've tr I've been working on redoing my Debbie rankings. Um Kevin, I know you were redoing yours too because Christian was on the pod last week and mentioned that like the spreadsheet was wonky because you were redoing rankings, which is fun. But I've just been working on mine and I'm shifting my thinking and ranking running backs because I have tended to do Debbie rankings where I prioritize young guys with incredible upside. 
And with running back, Todd and I have had this conversation. And Todd, I think you don't totally agree with this, but I'm really starting to deprioritize some of the younger running backs with the potential upside and actually slot in guys that are starting to show out that could deliver in the NFL, because I think that that is the way the position is starting to play out, where we don't totally know whether these guys are going to get real situations. An exception to that is a guy like Justice Haynes for me, or a guy like Baxter, who are in programs that develop and put many running backs into the NFL, that I feel confident that those top tier talents can actually go. But I'm very nervous about it. Um, I do think Travion's still the RB1 on the 24 class. Um, Jonathan Brooks could give him a run for his money, though. <laughs> like, Jonathan Brooks balled out this weekend and has been balling out all year. So, yeah, do, do you all, do you all still, you all are still on Travion right now? And how solidly? Yeah, he's my one for in this class for sure. I said on our other pod when we did the rankings that. There's, I still think there's a real chance that a year from now he's the he's the RB two in dynasty. Like I could see him overtaking Gibbs. Like he's a more well rounded player. We don't know what's going to happen with like Brees Hall was not thought of as this big premier prospect before he got drafted. He just he blew up the combine and then people started talking about him. Then he landed in a good spot. And if you remember back to his rookie year, people were talking about devaluing because Michael Carter was there because they draft they didn't draft Michael Carter the year before to to come in and replace him with. You know, we saw the same thing with, we've seen it with, you know, um, who was I thinking? Oh, like Kenneth Walker and, yeah. And, uh, Charbonnet last year. Like people keep thinking these guys are going to come in. And so it's, it's everywhere. Like we've devalued everything. The, the NFL landscape's not any better than the Debbie landscape is at running back. Like it's changed so rapidly that these eight, like Chris McCaffrey was toast two years ago. If you had Chris McCaffrey and he was hurt two years ago, you couldn't even trade him. There was no point trading him because no one paid you anything for him. He's done. He hit the apex, the running back apex, and he's useless. And then all of a sudden, now he's the top player in Dynasty again. So it's, it's just wild. The thing I'll push back on is, like, the ranking. If you're ranking, like, for me, if I'm ranking for Devi, I'm ranking for ultimate upside. So just because if, if I rank a guy in my top 12, it's, it's just me trying to forecast his ultimate ceiling in the NFL and what he could be. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you're drafting that way. Even if you have a guy like in your top 12 Debbie running back, you could take 30 wide receivers before you touch him at, in a draft. It's just if we're ranking the, the top 12 players and at positionally, then you got to do it. Like, like Jamari Miller is a guy who I really liked last class. I, I said I would have him as my running back one if he was a freshman in this class. You could still make the argument for him being like a top six or eight running back and he could be the same thing as he could he could come along and do the same thing that brooks is doing at texas where he sits for two years doesn't even touch the field yeah. and then gets his shot and then you're still going off his initial evaluation and his prospect prospect profile and took that long to get the opportunity it's just it's the hard thing with debbie running backs the forecasting them that they they don't leave the breadcrumbs of metrics and stuff along the way that the wide receivers do so it's hard to forecast I think it's important too to have self awareness as a Debbie manager. Like if you miss on running backs and suck at them, just don't draft them because I think that you can go out and like you can go out and buy some veteran guys and kind of do that. Like I think it's just that. Like if you if you struggle and miss, like I miss on Zach Evans. I still think Zach Evans is talented, but he didn't hit, you know. And it's just like it's like okay, well I miss on that, so how can I reestablish it? And I think the Jamari and Miller thing is a a good point because. You know, looking at my rankings, it's like, should Jade not be ahead of him? I don't know, because Jade not does show some flashes of what he can do. Like he runs fast and the NFL loves guys that can run fast. And so it's like, how do you project that? So I do think there's question marks there. It's like Donovan Edwards. I still like Donovan Edwards. I probably shouldn't because I know Todd hates him. But I was like, I just look at his his pass catching upside and his ability to do that. And if he can find himself on a team like Michigan might not be the spot for him. Right. Like maybe he does that. So I think it's just it's, it's incredibly difficult. But I think it's okay because in Debbie, we're not talking about deep drafts. Like unless you're a degenerate and you're like 10, 15 rounds, whatever the case, if you're not in deep drafts, then, you know, go after those premium positions, you know, you can hit on it wide receiver the first three rounds and then take some shots, right? You could get a Jonathan Brooks. You could get some of these guys later. Le'Veon Moss has looked okay a little bit this year. Like it's weird, but he's like all of a sudden there, or you can go out and get like a Marion Hampton, like some of these guys, like in the fourth, fifth round. And then you just bank on that. So there's always value there. 
even the guys who are at the top of the yeah. pile are like the Judkins, Judkins and Braylon Allen. Mm-hmm. They were never, they weren't high end prospects. You got them if you got them in Devi, you either paid up second year or you got lucky and landed Judkins in the fourth or fifth round of your Debbie draft, and then you hit gold. And then you get that value bump that we talk about all the time. Then you have a decision to make whether you think you hold them long term or you just flip them and flip them for an NFL asset or flip them for two Debbie assets or whatever the case may be. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. And uh, I think we're, well, we're going to get into Judkins a little later too, because he's, he's a, he's a lo- really interesting case study and totally agree with all that uh, in terms of just knowing your own ability to scout players and hit players and making choices as a manager is super important. Um, all right. Moving over to wide receivers, which is a different level of topic. Um, we'll start at the top with Marvin Harrison Jr., is Marvin Harrison Jr. a top five dynasty wide receiver right now? Uh, so I, you know, I was, I just wanted to pull up my rankings real quick. Um, yeah, yes, fact. I think he's, I think he's five at least. So like when I'm looking at like where he's at, I think he's at least five, and I'm a fraud because I have him at six, but I think he's right there. So like in my combined rankings. Um, I, I think fact he's a top five guy. I wouldn't put him above Jefferson or Chase, but I think there's an argument to be said for Waddle, Wilson, Lamb, and some have my Amon Ra, but I think he does step in as a top five guy. Todd, what do you got? It's fool's goal because he's three. Like I said, August, he's three. <laughs> or ultra fact, he's whichever three. you want to go with. He's three comfortably, meaning, meaning Todd, that you are, meaning that in a Debbie league or a C2C context, you are willing to move any wide receiver on the NFL side. If anyone sent you a trade of Marvin Harrison Jr. for any wide receiver on the NFL side, not named Jefferson or Chase, you would accept the deal. Yeah, I would. And you could probably get you should be able to get a plus if you can negotiate. You should be able to get a plus on top of it because he's still got some kind of risk. He could tear his ACL in the last six weeks of the season or something, right? Yeah. But just, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's difficult. I've, I've done that forecasting of like jamming those college and Debbie guys into the NFL. And you got and at some point, you got to make a call. You got to stand on it. So if I'm saying he's going to be my three and value him that way, then yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I I say yes. I think he's a top five. I think a, I think he's especially solidified as top five with the, I think the three through, the three through eight range of dynasty wide receiver rankings has gotten a little murkier even throughout the year than I think it was at the very beginning of the year, where it's a little tougher to project some of these guys. And I think his his prospect profile and size and capability make him a pretty instant instant top five dynasty receiver and a pretty easy 102 in in debbie rookie drafts at least for me at this moment um where it gets a little more complicated is after that so let's hop down to his his teammate here Emeka Egbuka is we, we actually i'm going to combine a couple of takes and and basically we can fact fiction all of them by answering the question so a couple of takes that were sent in Emeka Buka is the wide receiver two of the 24 class xavier worthy is the wide receiver wide receiver two of the 24 class and i'll lump in a third one of troy franklin is a first round nfl draft pick and potentially even up to wide receiver right wide receiver two of the 24 class so are those answer that are those fools are those fact fiction or fools gold and who are who is your wide receiver two in the 24 class kevin you got your so so Emeka, i'd say uh uh fiction i don't think he's wide receiver two anymore and i don't care i don't care what ohio state i don't care what analytics says either so jay stein could kiss my ass so like i'm out on Emeka <laughs> as being my wide receiver too i still think he's a good wide receiver though like i don't i'm not out on him as like a prospect 
but I, I don't think that he's right there for me. I'm going to say fact for Troy Franklin as a first round NFL draft pick because that's for the brand. And for my brand, I never wavered. Troy Franklin has been my guy since he came out. Uh, Brandon Lejeune from Debbie Deep Dive, he wavered after his freshman year. He's like, I've never drafted an Oregon wide receiver. I remember that, Brandon. So I got the receipts on that one. And he's back. So I think Troy <laughs> could possibly be a first round demo draft pick. So I'm going to say fact there. Um, the two is interesting for Xavier Worthy. I I'm going to say fact because I have Xavier Worthy as my wide receiver, too. I just, it gives me pause because he can't catch sometimes. Like, that's my yeah. big pause with Xavier Worthy, which doesn't <laughs> which not sound great for a wide receiver. But I think from, like, a like a prospect and, like, what he does well and what the NFL likes, I think he's right there, right? So, like, my rankings right now are Worthy at two, Neighbors at three, and then I have Ameka at four, Franklin at five. So, like, I that's kind of how that rounds up my top five right yeah. now. It's very close, though. Those guys are all very close. I could see Neighbors easily being the wide receiver, too, and maybe being challenging Harrison is from a fantasy aspect. Um, but I just love Xavier Worthy, his ability to separate. I think he fits well into that system. Uh, he has improved his drops this year, so um, that's how I look at those three takes. Todd, what do you think? Jay Stein catching strays. I like how Kevin acts like people are actually listening to this. He's just giving these shout outs like they're never going to hear this. Like, uh, uh, I'm going to say fact for I still have as my two. I just think he does everything so well he's so polished i still keep him there so be fixed on worthy but worthy is my three and like we've talked a bunch i have like a deshaun jackson comp for worthy i think he's got that easy glide acceleration thing where he's just gonna teams are really gonna covet it mm -hmm. um so i still i still really like him uh and i'm gonna i oh, i love troy franklin i've been on the troy franklin train forever i'm gonna say fiction because i think I'm kind of leaning the other way with this wide receiver class. So we've talked about so many of them go in the first round. I think the depth might hurt a couple of them that teams know that they can wait on a guy and get them early second round. So I don't know that the, we're going to see the five, six guys go in the first round. I wouldn't be surprised if we cut it off at the four after mm -hmm. worthy neighbors go. And then guys like Troy Franklin, Keon Coleman, Odunze, and I mentioned those type of guys get kind of prioritized around you see teams like after day one kind of shuffle and rearrange like we saw with t higgins and michael pittman a couple years ago where teams kind of regrouped after the first day and be like okay we need a receiver let's go up and get our guy that's left on the board so i think the depth is gonna hurt a couple guys and i think franklin might be one of those guys that's interesting i this this year is going to be fascinating because we do have I think I think we I think we could see as many as six wide receivers go in the first round this year, just based on talent compared to previous years with what I'm looking at. Also, the free agent class for wide receivers this coming up year is pretty gnarly. Like it it is, I mean, you have some of the most talented guys that could still resign. So this class could get a lot shorter if they end up just resigning. But you could see guys like Ayuk, you could see Pittman, you could see, I mean, you could, like Ayuk and Pittman, we haven't had a receiver like Ayuk or Pittman in their prime on the free agent market as a wide receiver in quite a while. And I think that'll be interesting. To, I'll be interested to see how that impacts teams' decision-making and whether teams want to get into a bidding war with with the home teams over some of those guys and trying to sign them out or whether they want to go after first round receivers. I, so I, I think this year either could turn out like Todd said, or could turn out like two years ago where we saw like six wide receivers go from 10 to 20, basically like back to back to back to back all in a row. And my wide receiver two for the 24 class has, has become Malik neighbors and I don't want to say it's not close, but it's it's pretty. I'm pretty definitively on the Malik neighbors wide receiver two train. And Kevin, you kind of hit on it. Like I think he's the guy. When I look at this landscape, he's the guy who has that fantasy ability to even potentially challenge the top tier guys for fantasy production. Because what he does, his I'm going to go Jay Stein and go analytics with it. Like his metrics are off the charts. Um, they, what he is doing from from a from a meaningful production perspective is pretty significant. Um, his his yards per route run 
his um, his his ability to separate, uh, his yards after the catch ability, um, his ability to break tackles and miss tackles. Like he he has he has more missed tackles than he, he's in the top sort of ten percent of wide receivers with his amount of volume in terms of missed tackles after the catch. And he's playing SEC defenses. He's not playing slouches. Um, his dominator rating. If you look at his his adjusted dominator rating, if you look at his adjusted receiving yards per team pass attempt, if you look at his EPA per team pass attempt, all of which are considered important projection metrics for NFL wide receivers, he's ahead of all of the t- he's ahead of where Jefferson, Chase, Egbuka, everyone else in his class, uh, Devonte Smith in his last year beat him out in a couple of metrics when he had that absolutely insane year. But what he's doing production-wise is unbelievable. And I think his athleticism is a little bit underrated. And his size is pretty good, too. He's almost 6'1". He's 200. He's not a tiny wide receiver. He's exactly the right size that the NFL likes. And he also plays, he plays like, he's got a 49-51% slot and outside split, which is, for college receivers, really, really versatile. And I just think that's the type of guy the NFL is looking for now. And as I've looked at it and watched him just explode for over a hundred yards in four straight games against premium competition, I've moved neighbors into wide receiver two in this class. So I'll go fiction on a being the wide receiver two Cause I think it's going to be Malik neighbors. Um, I think Troy Franklin is going to be a first round pick and um I do think that MHA is a top five dynasty wide receiver right now. And I think Agbuka will enter. I'm sorry. I think that neighbors will enter the league and be a top at least 12 to 15 with the potential to jump up pretty fast, depending on where he gets drafted. Mm -hmm. That's my bold push. You lost me when you said analytics. That's it. But That's I agree. Got. But, it, <laughs> yeah, good, yeah. but that was a good point. I appreciate you. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think we're all just. You know, I think they're all very good. You know what I mean? Like these guys are. Yeah. They're gonna. They're they're the top of their class. I don't see anybody jumping in there. But yeah, yeah. But analytics. I can't. I can't do it. You can't do. I mean, I can't do all of it. But what I can do is look at guy. Is is what I can do is look at the premium and an- analytics and look yeah, at yeah. like a few specific things that tend to project and look at where dudes project and where their family is. And when I see that family, I'm like, this is an interesting thing. So I'm not a huge analytics guy, but like, there's a lot going for him, and he looks, he also looks great. So I, I love that about him. All right, off of analytics. Um, oh, back to RBs. We've got Braylon Allen is the RB2 of the 24 class and a lock for day two NFL draft capital. Fiction. It'd be, yeah. be quick for me. Fiction. I I, I think Braylon is an interesting case because I do think some NFL teams will like him, but I don't think he's a lock for day two NFL draft capital. Yeah, yeah I've, I've definitely got fiction. I've said enough about Braylon Allen on this spot, I think, over the, the – <laughs> month and a half or two months i think it's fool's gold in fiction i i don't i personally don't think braylon allen is going to be a successful running back in the nfl and i think the draft capital is fiction but do you think bucky irving is going to be a successful running back in the nfl is that our next one is that the next take you're going on that is the next one. Yeah, I'm just transitioning us right in because because our listeners know I'm I'm 100 percent right. fixing on Braylon Allen RB two. So, um, yeah. How do how do you feel about Bucky? So the Bucky Irving take was RB three in this class, and that's a that's humongous right. fool's gold for me. And this is one of those ones, like I said before, even if it's true, even if it's true, he's Michael Carter. So who gives a shit? <laughs> So, <laughs> I don't think he's top three, but I don't hate him as much as uh, Todd apparently does. I like Bucky. I think uh, the thing is, though, I see some people talking about Devin Achan and being like, oh, if he's successful, B- Bucky's not as fast as Devin. So, like, let's just, you know, let's let's chill out there just because he has that light like frame there. I think Bucky's okay. Like, I think Bucky could be a very serviceable back in an NFL roster. But, yeah, I think his range of outcomes – 
point. It's like, uh, you know, when you're looking at like Marvel, what's the what's the dude that knows the future? I cannot think of his name off the top of my head now. What Marvel, Marvel character, dude that knows the future? Uh, Doctor Chris Strange. Doctor Strange. Strange. Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange. For sure. Now, Christian Williams does it. He's been getting just torched by fantasy recently tonight. Uh, so no. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. um, Doctor Strange. So when you're looking at Doctor Strange, uh, you know, when he's talking about how many outcomes, range of outcomes you have, Bucky's range of outcomes probably lean towards Michael Carter upside, right? Like that's kind of where you would, that's, that's realistically. Yeah. Now, if he's an outlier, then yeah, I think that has, it's like when he, when he puts his finger up as that one, that one good finish. Um, that's why I, I, I hesitant to do that when I'm looking at my rankings for Bucky, I do like Bucky. Like I, I was seeing that my rankings are there and that just comes from a little bit last year. I think from I, and I don't hate analytics. I, I do enjoy analytics. So, so I was just messing with uh, Noah a little bit, but I think he does hit some metrics. Um, but here's the thing, like, do we think Bucky Irving could be a better NFL back than Raheem Sanders? Because I kind of do. And I know that's really hot takey. But, like, I think maybe from an NFL standpoint, he could be, right? I think he could be. Yeah, and I think he could also – also Braylon Allen, for that matter, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not hot takey for me. And I just – I'm just playing. I'm just leading into this whole thing. But uh, to go back to the Fool's Gold and the, and the Michael Carter specifically – that even if it is fact and he is the RB3 just because the class is so bad, if it's like revisionist history, we saw this a couple years ago, the Michael Carter draft, people were taking Michael Carter over Waddle and Devonta Smith in rookie drafts. He was going yeah. at the tail like and Trey Sermon. People were trading up to pick those guys at the end of the first, beginning of the second round because everyone, because the quarterback or the running back market was so thin and you got to take the guy who's second or third in the class. So He's got a clear spot to start. It's just, it's it's the same thing again. If you, even if he is the three, I don't think it matters personally. But if he is the three, people are going to fall for that trap again and take him over these wide receivers who have a be- much better outcome for your fantasy team. Yeah, I for sure agree with that. And I, I think Bucky will get drafted. I don't think he's. I I, I think it's unlikely he's wide receiver at uh, the running back three, but a team could fall in love with him and just say, he's our guy. I want to take him. Uh, and in which case I, you won't find me drafting him because I, I don't, his cost is going to be too high and I don't love his game that much. I, I don't think he's the best running back on his own team. That doesn't mean that his game can't translate. Well, he can't have a role in the NFL in some capacity. He does some things that could function well in the NFL, but frankly, I thought, Noah Whittington was 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 outperforming him right before he got injured. And Jordan James is a very different style of running back. But I think Jordan James is the best pure runner on that team. Bucky's more of a third down kind of satellite back that I think could fall into that overhyped, getting overdrafted mold that we see some guys get into each year. Um, and the last take back to wide receivers is actually getting – it's our only one out of the 24 class. Nope, except for the Singleton one, which is that Evan Stewart is the Debbie wide receiver one going into next season. And Todd, this one was yours, so I'm going to let you pick this one off. Yeah, this one was mine. And I I have Devin, Evan Stewart as my Debbie wide receiver two currently. So this is all fact for me. And I, I think there's going to be a little bit of pushback because Luther Burden has played so well recently, like this season, and answered a bunch of questions. But – we were on the other side of burden all off season. People were talking about his efficiency metrics and questioning everything he does on the field. And we we're kind of pushing back and saying like, not only does the freshman production not really matter, but he hit all the thresholds you look for. And it's probably a good sign that an SEC program made a point of getting him on the field all the time. That being said, I still like Stewart's profile better because he's in that Calvin Ridley, Garrett Wilson type of mold where he just does everything so well. He's such a good route runner, contested catches. He's good. His hands are great. Uh, he's just a superb all-around prospect. And I think the league's going to fall in love with him. And as much as Burden's improved getting down the field and making those plays, he's still a lot of athlete is his profile. And he's an NFL athlete already, but a lot of a lot of what's making him successful is that he's been the focal point playing in the slot, and they're making a point to make him the focal point in an offense. And just his upside on athleticism. So I don't know that. I don't know that that translates 
as well. I still think it does. I think still think he's a good NFL. He's going to be a good NFL player, and he's still my he'll be my wide receiver in that class. But I just think Evan Stewart has more outs, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I'm, you know, I'm an Evan Stewart stand. So like, I, this is a fact for me just because of my rankings where I have them. But yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, Luther's, Luther's performed very well. And last year, I don't know what people were talking about last year. I think there's, I think people like with Luther, he hit every dominator rating that you like to see. Like he was phenomenal last year. And so like, and I had him ranked accordingly. He was my wide receiver, the two of the 25 class behind Evan. Um, but like, I don't understand that. I think some people just try to be smarter than they are. And then they try to get the takes first. And then they, they think they can kind of jump on them because Luther is going to perform. And he did that. Well, um, Evan to me, like Todd talked about, I think you can win in different ways. I think Luther is, you know, the, he gets the Debo comp all the time, which is fine. Like Debo's fine. But I think that if Luther's going to succeed well, he it, it's, it's, and we've been talking about this on the dynasty show a lot. I think it really does matter where these guys go because yeah, Luther is talented, but if he goes to an Arthur Smith led team, he's going to suck because they're not going to use them. So like, like that really matter. He goes to a Ben Johnson led team, whoever that is, maybe the Patriots at this point or whoever, wherever they're going to go, like in terms of this new offense, then yeah, Luther could be a weapon and then be utilized in that offense. Whereas I think Evans pretty, like he has a pretty safe floor, put him in an offense. He's going to be able to succeed anyway, because that's a prototypical wide receiver in the NFL. Luther's going to need some help there. So like I would have Evan Stewart right now, yeah, I could see this. This is to me, it's like, hey, a fact. I'm okay with him being the wide receiver one, but I'm okay with the other guys not having him as wide receiver one. It's not like it's like do or die for me. Like I understand why you maybe would have Luther ahead of him. Yeah, I'm super torn on I, I'm I'm very, very torn, uh, and I flop a little bit. And they're they're uh, I think the way you said it is right. They're opposite profiles. Um they almost they almost mirror each other in slot versus outside time they spend in the slot versus time they spend outside. Evan's a little more balanced, but um, I think that the the landing spot is so huge for for Burden because the Debo comp makes sense, but also you can put him in that slot category in that big slot category and the fact that he can do more and I do think his game's getting more sophisticated in some ways I think he has as much or higher upside because of what he can do after the catch if he can develop more but the thing is Evan Stewart's mold fits fits beautifully and the o- the only thing about Stewart's game that that isn't sort of that doesn't pop as elite in terms of what he does is yards after the catch but we've seen lots of, I mean, Olave, great example, right? We've seen lots of guys that didn't have that yards after the catch profile that have stepped into not perfectly designed offenses. Like the Saints certainly did not have an offense and a quarterback designed around optimizing Chris Olave, and they certainly have found ways to get him the ball constantly. And that's kind of the mold Evan Stewart's in. He's just a guy who can kind of do everything, get open, be incredibly reliable for QB. Uh, so I, I think it is... I think it is, I agree with the take, but I think it is fiction because I think that if if we're saying, is he my Debbie wide receiver one? Yes, I have him ranked there. I think he will, not, I think Luther Burden will be the Debbie wide receiver one and will be draft higher, drafted higher in Debbie drafts because he'll be hotter because his game is hotter. And I think people will fall for it more. And I think, Evan Stewart will fall further in drafts than Luther Burden in the Debbie world come next season, just because of what he's doing. So I need I'll give it to the transfer. Real. I need, yeah. I need Evan Stewart to transfer to Penn state and play with you all there next year. That's what I need. I need him to get oh out of Texas. A&M. God. That's what I need. To that do. would be unbelievable. That would be unbelievable. And then let's get, I mean, even if Keon, even if Lambert Smith stays, but if he leaves, it doesn't matter. Yeah, get him over to Penn State for sure. That would be incredible. Um, yeah, that would that would be great. I would love to see. I would actually love to see Evan Stewart transfer to be with a QB or to be into an offense where he could just get absolutely fed all the time. It'd be amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right, we are going to do a little. Uh, we're going to do a little stock up, stock down, and next man up, which we always do. And it's getting harder and harder to limit these stock choices to one guy per week. Um, so, uh, Kevin, why don't we start with you? 
who who are, who are, who's stocking up for you this week? Yeah, I think you know the, this week. It's so funny with Debbie stock up, stock down. I do it every week um, on our YouTube channel, and 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 sometimes it's hard because it's like the same guy, right? Like I had to quit doing um, I had to quit doing the stock up, stock down for freshmen because no freshmen are doing anything. So like I was like, shit, I can't just talk about Zachariah Branch every week. Like this is ridiculous. Um, but you know, I went Johnson Brooks from Texas. We talked about it a little bit earlier, uh, but I do again. 108 carries, 726 yards, and six touchdowns. Uh, his yards after contact is like over 350. Uh, his ability to cut inside and out has really good vision. And I think that you're just, you're hearing about him a lot now, right? Um, the last four games, he's been phenomenal. He had 200 yards against Kansas. He had a hundred yards in each of the other three games um, against Alabama. He still scored a touchdown. He looked good in that game. Didn't get a bu bunch of carries in that game, but yeah, I think, you know, Jonathan Brooks is moving up the board. You got um, Brugler talking about him now, Dane Brugler from the athletic. He's mentioning his name saying, Hey, he's rising up his board. Like, I think you have to start talking about Johnson Brooks right now from Texas. Yeah, I love that take. Uh, I think he's, uh, I think he's absolutely slamming up boards, and he is. I think he could. I, I, I think he will. I think he'll end up at this rate being uh, getting day two draft capital and having an interesting role on a team. And his pass, his pass catching and pass blocking metrics are, are really good also, which is, which speaks well to his potential for, for mm -hmm. three down work. Um, Todd, who you got? Uh, my stock up is Ollie Gordon uh, running back from Oklahoma state. I talked about him quite a bit during this off season. He's probably more of a C2C stock up guy because he's probably like still a day, even if he takes a job over, he's probably still a day three guy, I'd imagine. Um, but he's got 39 carries for 257 yards and touchdown and five catches for 19 yards over the last two weeks. He's basically just taking a strangle of that job. And if you look back at uh, like Mike, Mike Gundy's tenure at Oklahoma State, he's been there for 17 years. Uh, his RB1s average like 230 touches for – almost 1300 yards and, and double digits touchdowns. So and he's had some really big CFF producers over the years, uh, like Justice Hill, uh, Justice Hill, Chuba Hubbard, Joseph Randall, Jalen Warren, Chris Carson. So he's putting these guys in the league. So he has a pretty good track record on them. Like I said, they're mostly day three type of guys, but Gordon's also, I believe he's their top recruit they've had at running back in like a decade or so. He was RB19 last year in a comp state, 6'1", 211. So He's a high enough ranked player. He's a bit of a bigger upright running back that I don't love that part about him. But uh, yeah, he's he's really taking a stranglehold on that job. And he's like, he carried, I think he was 20, 20 plus touches to five to the next guy the last two games. So it looks like he's got that job. And if you remember, like Chuba Hubbard's not, he was like home run hitter with his speed, but he's not a above average NFL running back, I'd say. And he had like a 2,000 yard season there. So Gundy likes to feed these guys when he gets his guys, and Gordon's the best guy there easily. I think there was a lot of maturity questions in the offseason because there was a lot of like targeted, direct comments about him in the, in the media and stuff around on there. Kind of like we know this is our guy, but he's got to he's got to prove it. He's got to prove he wants it. So he's my guy. I've been on for a long time. So, but probably more of a more of a C two C guy. You think he's staying in school this year? Gordon, he's only a sophomore. Yeah. He's a sophomore, right? True sophomore. Yeah. Nice. But and that's another thing. If you if you think for C2C, he's probably he probably a four-year guy, unless he absolutely blows up and next year's class is as bad as this year, but it's not from from the Debbie landscape so far. The class is actually pretty solid next year. So he could be a four-year guy. So you get that production as well. Yeah, it's odd. Um, I went pure Debbie with my upside take and actually back to the freshman well, I got to talk about Eugene Wilson, the third from Florida. Um, he is, he played in, he had a couple injuries early in the year and was, and was actually a late enrollee, which often hurts new freshmen coming in. Um, and he's small, he's on the smaller side, uh, listed as 5'10", might be 5'9", uh, 180 to 200 pounds, though he's been putting on weight. He went for eight, he, he went for eight catches, 64 yards, and a touchdown this past week against Vanderbilt. And what's wild for him, even the game before that against Tennessee, which was two weeks before, and then he sat out a game for injury, he went six for 44. Um, he's had 21 targets as a freshman, and he's caught 20 of them. Um, his 
his yards after the catch are he's averaging almost 10 yards per catch, 10 yards after the catch per catch, which is unbelievable. He's an incredible athlete. And what's wild to me is that they're using him all over the field. He's getting, he's getting a relatively even split between slot and outside snaps and they're moving him around. They're bringing him in the backfield. He's got some inline snaps. He is the type of playmaker that I think is going to be really interesting in the sec for the next couple of years. Florida does not have, they brought in a couple other interesting fresh and wide receivers, but I think he is going to get featured more and more in this offense and be a guy that is going to just get a bigger and bigger role as the weeks go on and is going to rise in, in Debbie boards. And I think end up being somebody that goes in the top five rounds of Debbie drafts next year. And somebody that's going to be really interesting from a C2C side as well. And has a really interesting type of role in the NFL. He's lightning fast, lightning quick, Definitely, definitely go watch his highlights. Uh, maybe we'll put up a little, a little Eugene Wilson cut up. I know Todd would love that because Todd, you've been on this guy for like two years now, and actually put me, actually put me onto him originally. And the more I see of him, the more he's just electric. Yeah, he's. I don't think anyone was higher than me on him. I know Kevin got him in our one league where I cursed him in the chat. I <laughs> saw that. I think look at today. There's only two. There's only two leagues I don't have him in. Kevin has him in one, I think, and Maddie has him in the other one. And he was drafting off my rankings too. But he's a super interesting kid. NFL bloodlines. He has NFL movement skills already. He is a little undersized, but uh, you saw clips of him, him in the weight room at Florida this year. He's yep. a strong kid too for that size. So he's also kind of his freshman season is going to look a lot like Luther Burns did last year, just on a little bit less production. Uh, but he's the same thing. They're just getting the ball however he can. And that Tennessee game, the six for forty four. Was all opening drive. He was the entire opening drive, and then he got hurt. He got tackled on the sidelines and hurts called him. Yep. Yep. So, and then just came yeah, back and popped. He's a really interesting guy. I really like him. Yeah. Big stock up for It'll him. It'll be interesting to see how he's watching him the rest of the game. Oh, go ahead, Todd. It'll be interesting to see how he's used down the line. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to be interested um, to see his, his, his take a lot of handoffs. He's also a pick and punt returner, too. So, He's got that. That's yeah. always good if you have that in your back pocket for NFL type stuff because those guys, day three guys for sure, anyways, for on return skills alone. So nice. Nice. All right, cool. Um, so stock down. So my stock down is a guy I actually really love as a player in general, but uh, I got to identify him as stock down. And I've been kind of chatting with Todd about this for weeks about when I was going to actually talk about it. But Quinchon Judkins, his stock is down. Uh, and what I mean by his stock is down is that Quinchon Judkins was going in Debbie and C2C drafts in the, I saw him go as high as four, sometimes even three in some crazy situations and no lower than eight to nine in Debbie startups. And what we've seen from him, which is interesting, is he was a three-star recruit. Uh, so he, he burst onto the scene a little bit out of nowhere. Nobody was really expecting much from him last year. And he ended up getting this incredible volume role and doing a lot out of it. I, I, and I think he, and I think Judkins is a good running back. I think he has a future in the NFL. I think he will be drafted and I think he will get a role on an NFL team. And I know he's working on diversifying his game and he's definitely improved his pass catching pass blocking this year. He's a very physical runner. He does not have high end elite speed. But his running this year has taken a huge efficiency dip uh, from what it did last year. And again, I'm not exactly sure why or what happened, but it's some of the risk that we talked about with, with, with these Debbie running backs is that some of these guys that have these years where they pop off and put up these incredible numbers, it's often really hard to repeat those numbers. And I just think that Judkins is um, somebody whose stock is down. And so... Like if you were to do Debbie drafts today, I would be surprised. Like I would be surprised to see him get drafted in the first round. I do not think that he got drafted before Luther Burden, Evan Stewart. I don't think he's getting. I don't think you're going to get Evan Stewart and Luther Burden back for Quinchon Judkins in trades right now. And I would not trade Stewart or Burden for Quinchon Judkins in a C2C league, even if I needed a running back. I still wouldn't do that. Uh, I just think he's, I, I just think it's an interesting situation. We've started to see a little bit of a backfield split there. Um, I don't think that means that he's 
I, I don't think any of this means that he's not good. I just think it is part of the fool's gold of drafting those hyper productive running backs and sometimes ones who don't have that absolutely elite pedigree so early that now we see a situation where his stock is trending down. And there's a little theme here, Todd. We've talked, we, we've been like kind of working through the running backs that were getting drafted in the in that in the top of the first round and into the second round that have all not quite put up the same production that they did last year and are all taking a hit relative to other to other players in the Debbie landscape. So unfortunately, Judkins is a stock down in the Debbie landscape for me, especially relative to where he started. Still think he has value, but uh, he's taken a little bit of a hit for me. Yeah, to provide context, we did a Debbie mock recently uh, for the Debbie Royale. He went at the 308. So he went in the 308 for Jetkins. So he dropped out of the first two rounds. Um, Running backs taken taken before him was Trey Benson, Cedric Baxter, and Braylon Allen. And then you had like the other guys, Raheem Sanders, Nicholas Singleton, and everything. So he's still a top seven or eight back, but that didn't get taken until the third round. That's how far running backs have fallen down. That's crazy. I, I, that, so, yeah. that, proves, that was my theory. That's helpful to know because I'm like, am I crazy? I don't think he would go. Yeah, he's. Eesh. Yeah, he went right before Marshawn Lloyd. So Marshawn Lloyd is like right next to Quinshot Gokins now. So that's kind of where the Debbie running back standpoint is. Um, but that's just, this, you know, that's the that's the that's the position. Um, I was going to talk about Ja'Cory Brooks, but he just sucks. So I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to do I'm going to do Javante Barnes. Uh, I, I you know I think Ja'Cory Brooks dropped down a little bit, but I I do think Barnes is someone that I think his stock has dropped a little bit. Maybe just for me, um, he's been banged up this year. I know he hasn't been out there, and 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 that's hurt him a little bit. But with 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 what Oklahoma's been able to put out there at that running back position. You know, I would expect more from Barnes. I wish he didn't get injured, but even when he wasn't, like he didn't look that good. Marcus Major has looked okay. Um, Tyree Walker has looked pretty good. Like maybe Javante's not that guy, and he hasn't played. I know that, but I, I think Barnes at the running back position, Jacory Brooks, those two guys are guys that have been drafted kind of higher in, in in spaces. Brooks higher than most. I mean, he was getting first and second round Debbie Buzz two years ago, heading into his junior year or sophomore year, and he just hasn't produced. So. Brooks and Barnes to me are two big stock down guys. Totally agree. I had on Walker this past weekend. Walker was a walk on too. Yeah. And is, and is doing, and I like, he's, he's running really nicely running. Well, I'm not saying he's an NFL guy, but totally agree with that take. Todd, what do you got? Corey Brooks going to tra- transfer to UCF next year and blow up. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. No. Uh, yeah, my stock down is uh, – I kind of cheated this one. I went with the whole Kentucky passing offense. Uh, I was a big Devin Leary guy a couple years ago. I thought he was like the draft sleeper, first-round quarterback that was going to sneak in there. He looked phenomenal at NC State two years ago. Like tons of NFL throws on his tape, his touch, his ball placement was insane. Uh, since they got into like conference play and not even good teams in the conference, they've been terrible, just terrible. And uh, shout out to our guy, Corey Pereira, uh, FF guitarist on Twitter. He put out his little video a, while, a couple days ago, a week ago maybe, about uh, Barry and Brown and uh, his his usage, which is interesting that like last year he had like something like 40% of his, his targets were at or behind line of scrimmage and it's down to 16 this year. And his A dot is actually around 17, which is encouraging because that's how he's going to win at the NFL by being a vertical threat. He's a super, super raw player coming out of high school. He was a lot of just supreme athlete. And he's also maybe the best kicker turner in the nation. So it puts him on on the map for NFL draft capital. And I still like Barry Brown. I, I really like him going forward. And I think he'd still, he could still turn around and be a first round NFL pick next year. Um, but where he was going in Debbie drafts and the cluster he was in. Now you see with like Evan Stewart and Luther Burden and Ted McMillan have drawn a pretty, pretty solid line in the sand as a top tier of guys in that, in that class and separated themselves from the pack mightily. I think Antonio Williams is still there. It's hard to rule him out because the injury, but those three have like elevated themselves to like, if you had to guess, I bet on them all being first round picks in 2025 and Barry and Brown was going around in that same grouping to the tail end of Tet 
whoever pick your poison, whichever guy you wanted. And just right now, based on the production and non-production he's having, you just there's no way you can recoup that value right now. It's just uh it's just part of the Debbie landscape and the market and how fast things change that sometimes you just get stuck holding a dead asset. So at this point he's he's on your roster and you just hope that it turns around. Yeah, the best part of the Kentucky offense right now is Ray Davis, honestly. <laughs> and uh He's uh, he, he's interesting and, and definitely he's getting some buzz. But yeah, it's been wild to see. I thought that offense was going to be really interesting with Cohen going back there and Devin Leary, and it has just not 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 played out at all. Um, so yeah, Kev, we do this uh, next man up thing. I remember actually, Todd, it's funny because when I first was chatting with Kevin about getting into Debbie content, Kevin was like, "So there's like a range of people that you can be like and." You know, he's like, so there's Todd Vincent on this one side who literally watches every single high school recruit going all the way through. And so now that we do this show and I love it, uh, I now know a lot about high school recruits and I appreciate Todd for pushing me into like, I follow a bunch of high school scouts and coaches and developers and we always preview somebody, usually somebody from the next uh, from the next recruiting class. So from this incoming freshman class. Although last year, last week Todd cheated and went to like a current high school junior who's trying to reclassify in the senior class, so he went even younger. But we always do one of those each week. And uh, Todd, I usually let you kick those off because you're by far the best at this. So tell us about Kawan Lacey. Yeah, Kwan Lacey is a guy I've been on for a long time. And uh, shout out to Kev for let me post my nonsense in the TDR Discord. This is kind of where I started putting stuff out in the public for people to see. And I did this back in April. I did my whole top 50 for the class and shared it with everyone there. And Kwan Lacey was a kid that I, I posted like a YouTube highlight from like a rivals camp of him, like just torching DBs and stuff in one on ones, passing reps and stuff. And I said, like, this kid has, like, 37 offers, and he's at three-star right now. This is, there's no way this is going to last. Um, he's actually up to, like, RB13 for on three, and they're way ahead of everyone else on him. So uh, he's, like, a top 165 overall in their class. So that's a massive, massive jump from last year. Uh, he's a Texas kid, plays 5A Texas, so the second level Texas, which is really good. He's 5'11 or 6 foot, depending on where you look, at, and 195 to 205. He's committed to Nebraska right now, but 247 actually has his prediction as Ole Miss, which is super interesting and is way better off than Nebraska. Only good thing about Nebraska would be he'd probably walk on and be the best player on that offense. But um, he is – he has a like a – I don't know if it's laser time, but he has a, a 4440, 500-pound squat, 300-pound bench, and a sub 11-second 100-meter time. 10 7 900 meters which is super impressive for a kid that age like a 17 year old kid uh this year in six games he has 96 rushes for 708 yards and nine touchdowns so 7.38 yards per carry and then he has eight catches for 143 yards and two touchdowns so he's got 17 almost 18 yards of reception as a running back uh on a team that only has like i want to say like 600 yards passing the whole team so he's basically their entire offense and he had a he had like a ninety yard kick return for a touchdown last weekend too. So he's a really really interesting kid. Uh, six foot, two hundred five pounds coming out of high school as a high school junior coming in your senior year. It's a really good size. And those, I mean, it's kind of folklore at this point with like times and weight room stories and whatever else. But this was uh, I don't know if it was a rivals or two four seven one. They put out an article about he's the most important commit to Nebraska. And they need to do everything to keep him. So that was all in that article of all his physical tools and stuff like that. So it's really impressive. He just got offered by Florida on Friday night too. So I wouldn't be surprised when it's done that he's kind of a four-star across the board. And he's one of these, like, say, like in the Quinchon Judkins, Damian Martinez mold where you just look back and you're just like, why was this kid rated in the 40s and 50s by these other services? He should have been a top 10, 12 back in the class by everyone. Uh, so I'm – Thinking that most of the services will come around on them, uh, but if not, at least you know the name. 
Okay. Kevin, who you got? Yeah. So, you know, everybody out there should know that I'm not as degenerate as Todd is. Uh, but I do like different, like when I go and I dive into prospects and I, and I look for like sleepers um, at the running back position, if a kid is 5'11", like 205 to 215, I like him already. Like if they got the size and stuff, then I started looking. So that's how I look at three stars. So I want to dive a little deep. So I, I, when when you guys said you do this segment, I was looking for kids right now. I don't know if Todd knows who this kid is, but it's Davian Gaz, I think you say his last name. Gaze, Gaz, I don't know. He's 5'11", 215. He's a three-star kid out of Florida. Uh, but he is going to North Carolina. He's a hard commit, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to go to North Carolina. I, th I think that, you know, when I was watching this tape and going through there, first of all, his nickname is Bullet. So that's some cool shit. And then when you're looking at what he does, what does well, I mean, last year as a junior, uh, he, he ran a state title. So he let, he led his team to a state title. He had 1100 rushing yards, 19 touchdowns. Uh, but he is, when you watch him and you see him, he's just quick, man. He gets in and out. I mean, he runs track at a high level as well. That's something that I like too. as a sophomore, he ran for 1800 yards in high school and 17 touchdowns in Florida three a. So you're still talking about a pretty legitimate um, competition there. Uh, but when you watch his tape, the thing, thing that stands out to me is just he's a bullet like that's his nickname he gets into the line of scrimmage he can he can explode through um i do think that you know when you're looking at these rankings they're pretty fluid at this point in the season um he could go a little higher up there i think he has a good first cut like this is a kid that i like a lot just from the tape that i've watched and kind of diving into these guys to give you guys a name out there now i might be completely wrong people might not like it but this is how like i found caleb johnson with iowa like i was kind of a caleb johnson guy i have some tweets like six months before he even enrolled in iowa i saw like his tape i said hey this kid's kind of got that that special explosion factor in there i think he, he runs a little high he's gonna fix that i think technique wise he's gotta go there but Getting to North Carolina, you see what Omar and Hampton's doing, those type of things. He's got some pass catching upside. Um, Davion's a guy to kind of keep an eye on. All right. Davion Gauze. Uh, and I went the literal opposite route because we've done this take, we've done this section segment every single show, and we've not talked about Jeremiah Smith yet. And part of that is because I know Todd actually does not have him as the number one in his rankings. And he is the number one typically across the board. Or you have it? Do you, do you call him your one B, or you just straight call him two to JoJo? I need to jump in here for a second. He's Jeremiah Smith, actually, like three. Michael Hudson's two. Um, You're three. There you go. You guys are. This is funny because if you guys haven't realized this yet, Davian Goss is the running back for Jeremiah Smith and JoJo Trader's team, Shaman Amadana in Florida. It's a prep yeah. school. They're. They play a national schedule, yeah. so he does play supremely good competition. Yeah. And in the first first or second game of the season, they could not pass the ball, and Goss ran for like 179 yards and I think two touchdowns. It's on ESPN, against right? Noah's old against Noah's mm -hmm. old high school, and single handedly yeah. beat them. So this is pretty fun full circle right yeah. here. So this is actually kind of bull on this show. I was texting Todd because because I'm literally texting Todd and I'm like. It was not my high school, but uh, the the basically uh, the coach, the football coach at my high school is Biff Poggi, which Kevin, you'll know because he coached at Michigan and then left to go to yeah. Charlotte. And he after after my high school, after he first went to Michigan, he then went and started the program at St. Francis, which is where Blake Corum went and everything like that. So it was the St. Francis game. Couldn't pass the ball at all. And Todd's texting me like, oh, tell me every update about Smith and Trader. And I'm like, there are no updates. They can't throw the ball because Davion Goss was running the ball uh, the whole time. But Jeremiah Smith is actually a baller. So, uh, you know, putting being Todd's number three receiver does not mean that Todd hates you. It just means that Todd likes a couple guys a little more. I've learned this about Todd. Um, but uh, I, I think Jeremiah Smith is absolutely incredible so he like like todd said um the competition is incredible so he's been playing in addition to saint francis um he's been playing um bergen catholic which is was 20th in the country he's been playing miami central which was i think number six in the country when he played them um he's 6 3 205 incredibly fast he won 110 meter and 400 meter hurdles uh he's a track star kind of guy um great athletic background he's geno smith is his cousin uh his great uncle was an olympic uh was an olympic hurdler and his other uncle actually was a boxer who actually boxed against muhammad ali once uh so he comes from a nice athletic background 
And uh, man, like he's he put up. So it's interesting because he had he struggled in that one game. Um, I think it was against Bergen Catholic. He he threw up 300 yards and three TDs in three quarters, and then they just sat him out for the rest of the game because he was just running all over the field. He's incredibly fast, uh, really good body control. Um, he's got great tackle breaking. Uh, he can beat press coverage. He's got really quick moves off the line. Um, yeah, I wrote down arrogant hands for sure because he flashes some one-handed catches that are that are pretty nuts and crazy and some diving catches that are pretty awesome. So he's a really fun film watch easily. And um, he's got – I have written down that he has – 33 for 516 and seven TDs through four games this year. How true that is. That's high school football stats are as mythical as the, as the, four, as the sort of hurdle times are. But um, what was interesting about it was uh, so he is obviously from Miami and there was a bunch of, there were a bunch of stories about how he was at the Georgia tech game this weekend. And I was just kind of laughing about this because uh, it's it's a little unfortunate that that's the game that he there was a lot of buzz going into it that Miami was really working to try to get him to decommit from Ohio State. He's been committed to Ohio State since the beginning, and he's actually put out stuff on his social kind of he's gone on visits and kind of then re restated his commitment to OSU. And there was a some buzz that Miami was was making some inroads and that he was going to go to the Georgia Tech game, and then of course. Miami Mario Cristobal did Mario Cristobal things and decided to run the ball with 20 seconds left on the clock when he should have knelt the ball and Georgia Tech had no timeouts and they fumbled and then Georgia Tech won the game in the last second and you've got the clips on ESPN of Miami players crying and that was the game that they had Jeremiah Smith there and were all ready to make their pitch so I don't I I would have said before that situation that Miami was working to put itself in the run but I don't know Mario Cristobal was was close to being my stock down for for this week. In addition to Alex Grinch, the defense coordinator for USC, they were they were close in my running with with Quinchon for that. But Jeremiah Smith's going to be a beast for sure, and I think he's going to he's going to go incredibly high in Devi drafts next year. As soon as people see him, and as soon as people get on board with the buzz wherever he ends up he'll get the he'll he'll get incredibly high high Debbie draft capital and be worth it and he's the type of guy that could walk into Ohio State next year and make noise especially with Harrison and Ed Buka going he I, he can go into that room and absolutely uh I think carve a roll out for himself early on and have sort of burden Stewart type production even as a freshman he looks that good to me Awesome. Given the time, I think we're going to probably call it here. Um, but man, Kevin, it's always great to have y'all here. Um, always a pleasure to talk to you and joy, uh, especially from across the country. And on this, uh, it's always nice when the holidays align for different reasons in our <laughs> countries, which is great. <laughs> we're like the nights work out that none of us have, uh, none of us have work tomorrow, which is awesome. Um, and I hope you all have some good plans. But Kevin, before we go, you want to just let everyone know where they can find you. I know we talked about it a little bit in the beginning, but just to remind everyone where they can find you. Yeah, if you like Devi, you can find us over at the Devi Real YouTube channel. It's where we do it, post a lot of stuff on our Patreon. Um, and then if you like Dynasty, I do work at Football Guys. So you can go look at that. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at the boys underscore 22. I wouldn't follow me, but you can. <laughs> Nah, you should get you should give Kevin a, Kevin a follow. You'll you'll at least see uh you'll at least see him subtweeting Todd and and talking shit to Todd some of the time, which is fun. So yeah. that's always great. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, Todd, thanks so much as always. Great to uh, chat with you and to everyone else. We will see you next week for episode eight of Debbie Degens and enjoy. Another crazy week of college football coming up. Got some great rivalry games, and uh, we'll have a lot to talk about next week, I am sure. Uh huh. Yeah, the revolution, y'all, y'all, y'all. Yeah. Yep, yeah, the revolution. The revolution, y'all, will not be televised. Yeah, you gotta wake up, open your eyes Make a change in your life And find a new way of living It's time to start living for the children Everybody looking to the
of my life. Tell me, what you see? The perseverance of a young man sitting is so free. LA Mac, be the champ, but still 